I really don't know why I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, I, I just want to point out, though, that I, well, although I raised money for charity for jumping out of the plane, many people offered to double their pledge if I didn't wear a shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was surprised, and I'm certainly humbled and very honored to be receiving the Alumni Association's Public Service Award. On the one hand, I see myself as one of many dedicated lawyers who serve and have served in the Appellate Bureau, rather than one worthy of individual recognition. On the other hand, two things prompted me to accept. First, despite the appearance of humility, I have a very big ego. <laughs> Huge. Second, I thought if I could get Justice Palmer to introduce me, I'd have my only chance to publicly rebut something he says about my work. <laughs> I mean, he gets it wrong so many times, I just need a time. No, I'm kidding. I really couldn't pass that up. And, and I'll address his comments momentarily. But first, I want to explain how lucky I feel to be a UConn Law School alumnus. I transferred after my first year at Syracuse Law so I could live with my soon-to-be wife, Robin. She had a teaching job in uh, Windsor, and I had, and had no prospects of getting a job in Syracuse. So with the help of her Uncle Charlie and Professor Neil Scanlon, I'm sure some of you might remember Professor Scanlon, I scored an interview with admissions. It went something like this. Why do you want to transfer? So I can sleep with my new wife. <laughs> what happens if we don't accept you? I'll get married, return to Syracuse alone, and sleep with someone else's wife. <laughs> That's a true story. And, and I'm really convinced that the chutzpah of the answer clinched the transfer, because I have to tell you, it wasn't based on my first year grades. And I quickly realized my good fortune. Without going into detail, Syracuse was competitive. In stark contrast, UConn, the students, everyone was working together. Everybody helped each other out. And the professors there were accessible and talented educators. It was refreshing and it was a hell of a lot cheaper than Syracuse. <laughs> Returning to Justice Palmer's introduction, I, I thought I'd give you a less glamorous glimpse of Harry Weller, appellate lawyer. Like my first opinion, uh, appearance in the appellate court motions calendar, I aggressively sought to get a case dismissed because a brief was overdue. Justice, then Judge Borden, asked the clerk whose brief is overdue. Well, you might have guessed it, the state's brief was overdue. And Justice Borden turned to me and said, Mr. Weller, do you still want us to dismiss the appeal? Well, I, I happen to admit I'm very glad that that's not the only impression I got to leave with Justice Borden. <laughs> Another time I was appearing before Justices Callahan, Borden, Katz, Burdun, and Palmer, and I had trouble coming up with an English term that would pithily describe my thoughts. Justice Katz graciously invited me to use whatever praise came to mind. So I said, what if the story is a complete Bubba Misa? <laughs> Uh, that's a colorful Yiddish term for a whale of a tail. And you should note that for Justices Borden, Katz, Palmer, and Burdun, that reference was entertaining, but it was also enlightening. They also got something out of it. But poor Justice Callahan was mystified. <laughs> <laughs> While the others chuckled, I recall that he mockingly held me in contempt. <laughs> he held his colleagues in contempt. And a poor innocent public defender also got held in contempt. And Justice Borden has since told me that uh, the first order of business at the conference was to explain Bubba Meisa to Justice Callahan. <laughs> in yet another feat of appellatory addition, I was privileged to be engrossed in a discussion of state constitutional law with Alan Ash Peters. I mean, what could be better than that? At one point, she asked me to comment on the reasoning in State versus Stoddard. Now, she wrote Stoddard, and I had written the state's rather aggressive response to it in a motion to re-argue. The brilliant answer that came out of my mouth was, Stoddard is an example of bad law. <laughs> Thankfully, the chief responded graciously to what she knew was a verbal fart. <laughs> Lastly, although there's many more, um, I think, and I think this is true, you, uh, I'm the only attorney, I think, in the history of Connecticut who won a case in the appellate court, petitioned and convinced the Supreme Court to take cert, and then lost it in the Supreme Court. <laughs> I snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And if you don't believe me, State versus Earl Jacobs. Um, seriously though, any success I've had can be traced to those who've touched my career. I was most fortunate to grow up as an appellate attorney in a courtroom presided over by Ellen Ash Peters and to argue before David Borden regularly. 
in both the appellate and the Supreme Courts. If their colleagues and successors appreciate my skills as an advocate and find my arguments useful and sometimes persuasive, it's because I cut my teeth before those, appearing before those two intellectual and judicial giants. They set a high bar. Another thing, win or lose, I always feel like I can say what I want to say in the Supreme Court. And I also think that the court understands that sometimes I have to argue a loser. I mean, it just comes with the territory. I love arguing appeals so much in Connecticut that I tell my students that a tough argument before a hot, well-prepared bench is, to me, the most fun a person can have standing still, fully dressed. <laughs> if my briefs are clear, I owe it to my wonderful colleagues, who to this day are my teachers. I value having drafts returned marked in red, and they oblige willingly. No matter how fetched an argument I hatch, my colleagues keep it grounded. Likewise, without their input and pre-argument moots, I'd never be able to answer the court's questions. Really, um, I think you said it right, I, I would have accomplished nothing without my colleagues. If I'm fairly faithful to, to deadlines, I owe it to the paralegal and clerical staff. They skillfully handle all the administrative tasks that I find distracting. And also, when I teach, I make sure that the students meet the clerical staff. I want them to know what it's like to have first-rate people working with you. If I'm trusted by the courts, my colleagues, and opponents, I'm indebted to my parents, the position I hold, and the leaders I've worked with. My parents of blessed memory set an unwavering example of what it means to live a life of honesty and integrity. Moreover, because of my position, I have never had to make a hard ethical choice. And indeed, every chief state's attorney I've worked under, from Jack Kelly, Jack Bailey, Chris Morano, and now Kevin Kane, and of course, Justice Palmer, I worked for him about 20 minutes. Um, all of them gave me one charge. As it says in Deuteronomy, tzedek, tzedek, tir dof. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. I've also had amazing supervisors, beginning with Jim Clark, who's here tonight and hired me, Steve Sellers, Susan Gill, and now my dear friend, Susan Marks. All have been mentors and encouraged me to test myself as an appellate attorney. Appellate attorney. Susan Marks is remarkable. She's brilliant, witty, caring, insightful, a great writer, possesses the most wonderful judgment, and she's also masterful at keeping me happy, inspired, and enthusiastic. And that ain't easy. And if not for Sue, I would have lost this job 29 years ago. Uh, I was hired as a per diem, and I came down with a, uh, an illness that made it impossible for me to drive a car. I was a stranger to Sue at that time, yet she came and picked me up and drove me from West Hartford to Wallingford every single day. She went out of her way to do it, and I wouldn't be here now if not for that. So thank you, Rumi. Um, with all thank yous, I'd be remiss and I'd be in really big trouble if I didn't thank my family. That's easy, though. My, dog, my, my dad was convinced that as a state employee, I'd have regular hours. Robin and my daughters, Elena and Sarah, know better. Robin knew and the girls learned early that public service often requires sacrifice. They nevertheless take pride in what I do, all while putting up with dinner talk of murder and mayhem. I mean, how many kids do you know who can identify when they're on the highway the scene of some of Connecticut's most infamous crimes? <laughs> it's disturbingly true, but my daughters can. They love me nevertheless. Robin, your incredible work ethic is something I can only admire and brag about, but never equal. You've supported my career, taught for over 30 years, and still made sure that we always had dinner as a family. Robin's done all this while raising three children, the two well-behaved ones, Elena and Sarah, and me. <laughs> you know, based on Justice Palmer's comments, I really considered apologizing tonight for your life sentence as a spouse of a full-time appellate advocate, but then I decided it's really your fault. You supported my decision to leave the firm despite having no job waiting. It was that window in time that let me find my way to the appellate bureau, and you continued to work so we could afford that career move. Finally, to all of you, um, my job confirms daily the wisdom of the constitutional system we swear to uphold. I'm ever mindful that we're obligated to keep that system vital and viable. To me, that means, of course, tinkering with things that need tinkering, but also honoring, protecting, supporting, and explaining the value of time-tested doctrines that continue to serve us well. We're links in a chain, not independent actors serving the here and now. 
I've been privileged to play a small role in forging our generation's links in that chain, to stand before a constitutional court, to represent a constitutional branch of government, to debate with justices and very able opponents what our links should look like and how they fit together is an awesome but wonderfully rewarding responsibility. To be singled out for having done my job well is a bonus really beyond words can express. So I just say thank you.